What does it mean for a computer to understand language? Is it just knowing the definition and the meaning of each word? Well, no, we all know that it's deeper than that. Take the sentence, the stolen painting was found by a tree. Now, obviously we know that the tree didn't find the painting, but that's because you understand the context here. If a computer only had surface level understanding of words, it's possible that it could interpret it in a different way. Human language is an absurdly complicated and deep topic, so it should come to as no surprise that we have a hard time getting computers to understand it. By now, I'm sure you're familiar with ChatGPT. It's this mind-boggling, all-purpose chatbot that pretty much seems to know everything. It sort of represents a shift in the way we interact with computers. It's now possible for us to have meaningful conversations in English with our computer. But how did we get here? Things like ChatGPT are certainly not built overnight. Behind ChatGPT is a neural network architecture called a transformer. This series is sort of a precursor to the one in 3 Blue 1 Brown, in which you can actually learn the inner mechanisms behind a transformer. If you haven't already, do check it out after this one. It's an amazing watch. But to me, it's just as interesting to see what happened prior to the transformer. You know, what was built up in order to reach what we have today. So let's take a step back as I take you through a journey across the history of natural language processing. The idea of computers being able to understand language or natural language processing, commonly called NLP, is rich with many different kinds of problems to solve. Their speech, which could involve converting text to speech or converting speech to text, called automatic speech recognition. There's language modeling, which could consist of machine translation or just translating between languages, text summarization, or question answering. And the last category I'll call grounding, which means incorporating other human senses. So for example, converting text to images. In the first part of the series, we'll focus on language modeling. What we're building up to is the transformer model, the architecture behind the large language models you see floating around today. Later on, we'll examine other topics like image generation or inference algorithms. But before we get to ChatGPT, let's examine one of the early language models, n-gram models. Let's say I was trying to create some model to generate text, say, write me an email. To me at least, it's not actually that clear what we're even modeling over. For example, let's say I'm trying to create a model that can detect handwritten digits. In this case, it's fairly easy to create a metric for how good the model is. We can just check how many digits it was able to classify. So we make the goal, or the objective, to maximize the number of correct answers. But with text generation, what even is the objective? To this, a lot of things were tried, but eventually, the best early results came with next word prediction. Here's how it works. Let's call our model p theta, and define a number k, which I'll call the context window. What p theta gives me is a probability distribution across all words given the past k words. All this means is that if I feed in some previous words, say the sky is, and I examine some next word, say blue, p theta gives me the probability that blue appears given that the sky is has already appeared. The actual hard part though is computing that probability. We call the model that computes this probability the language model. And as we'll see, as deceptively easy this task seems, it's an extremely difficult and complicated task. But first, let's think about what the simplest way we can do this is. Let's say I roll a dice, and I'm trying to compute the probability that I roll a 2 or 3 on a 6-sided die. The way I do this is to see that I have 6 possible outcomes, and I only want 2 of them, so the probability becomes 2 over 6. Theoretically, to calculate the probability of blue occurring after the sky is, 
I'd probably want to find every single occurrence of the sky is in history and compute how many times blue came after. Now obviously this isn't possible, but what we can do is first gather a lot of text, say all the Wikipedia articles. Then in order to compute the probability that blue comes after the sky is, we look for every occurrence of the sky is and count how many times blue occurred after it. Some of you could see some problems here, you know, what if the sky is never occurs? The matching criteria is also really specific. I'm gaining no information from phrases such as the sky was. One solution to this is tweaking k, the context window. Here, I have three words of context, which I can reduce or increase to sort of make sure that I don't look for anything too specific of a phrase. In this case, if I reduce the number of context words, I'm losing the word the, so you can see how I could lose some important words by tweaking the context window. Since I'm losing information, this equation up here isn't really an equality, it's more of an approximation. I'm only really losing one word here, but you can see how if I had a paragraph of context, I would be losing a lot. This type of model, where I fix the context window size, and look for all occurrences of the previous words is called an n-gram model, where n refers to the number of words we examine at a time. So for example, if I had a context window size of two, I'm examining three words at a time. So we have a three-gram model, commonly called a trigram model. n-gram models were the first early renditions of language models, and there were several improvements to them over the years. For instance, we can apply some smoothing function to make sure that the denominator is never zero, in the case that the prefix never occurs. Also, you have the trade-off of choosing the value of n. Too large a number, and you have a hard time finding the context in your text. Too small a number, and you get a bad model. So, armed with our language model, we can now find a way to generate text. Let's say I start with the prompt, the most beautiful proof in math is. Now, I have a distribution for all the possible next words. The way we pick words is by sampling from this distribution. What this means is that if the probability of A appearing next is 0.08, then I pick it with probability 0.08. I could do this by maybe choosing a random number between 0 and 1, and figuring out which word my number falls into. There's a whole world of algorithms to figure out how to generate text given a language model, and one of the future videos will be on this. But for instance, I could restrict the words I sample from to just be the top 10. A level above is I could create what's called a chain of thought, a sort of way for the model to reason through its output, but we'll save that for another video. Okay, great. So let's try sampling with the trigram model. And it's outputting words, but it's not the best. A big part of why is since we only take in three words at a time, we can't really get information from the previous sentence or paragraph. You can really see this happening with the example here. It's completely lost the idea that we're even talking about math. We call these relations to previous sentences or paragraphs long-form dependencies, and this will be a common problem to fix throughout language modeling. And, well, people knew that n-gram models weren't the best. No one really used them to write emails or stories. Researchers sort of used n-gram models as a means to empirically study language. Today, I've shown you a simple, yet useful, language model. But there's so much to talk about. n-gram models are nowhere close to what we have today. A personal gripe I have about NLP is how arbitrary some of the decisions behind the techniques used seem like. So my goal across the next few videos is to sort of ease into each decision. I want to convince you that you could have thought about each of these yourself. In the next video, we'll cover how neural networks drastically improved our language modeling capabilities. Up until 2017, variants of the model we'll cover in the next video, the recurrent neural network, 
were used by Google Translate to translate between languages. And well, it works pretty well. So join me on the next video and I'll tell you all about it.